Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone to Coaching Conversations with the Executive Coaches of Orange County or EC of OC. My name is Ernest Stambouli and I am the chair at EC of OC. Um, we launched this series that we call Coaching Conversations with EC of OC uh, two weeks ago. And Coaching Conversations is a direct response to pressing issues and questions that we hear from our clients. EC of OC is a nonprofit organization that offers no cost leadership and management development to nonprofits in Orange County. And our mission is to help nonprofit, nonprofits fulfill more of their mission. So today at EC of OC, we understand that people in leadership positions are facing unprecedented uncertainty. We also understand that in uncertainty, uh, leaders have the higher responsibility of moderating unavoidable reactions and being in action, helping those most affected in their communities. So at ECOOC, we have about 60 plus coaches and growing, and our commitment is to listen and offer the best coaching in helping you, the leaders, uh, take purposeful action in these times of uncertainty. Our speaker today is David Cofero, executive coach at EC of OC and a strategic advisor at Strategic Advisory Consulting Group. David is also an, a published author. His book, Leading from Where You Are, started selling on Amazon uh, in January this year. So David is going to talk about the three key considerations when defining your next new normal. He's going to lead us in a conversation for exploration uh, that aims at helping you define your organization's next stage with the three key considerations. Recasting a rolling quarterly strategic plan, intentional discontinuation, and uh, development opportunities. Now, before we get started, here is how to listen to David in this webinar. This is an important background. When we expect the future to be a simple manifestation of the past, we only blind ourselves to new possibilities for leadership. The future will not be the same as the past. We kind of all know that. And leadership is not waiting for others to constitute our new normal. Uh, so David will be speaking to the leaders who are intent on reading the world and speculating with others who are resolved that the future is being brought forth by all of us together in vastly new ways and configurations than any other time in history. So before I hand it over to David, here's how to participate. Uh, all of you, the webinar attendees, are going to be in view only and listen only mode. So please take a moment and locate and open the Q&A window in your <clears throat> app. Right? And as uh, during David's talk, you can type in your question into the Q&A box. And uh, when you click send, feel free to check send anonymously if you do not want your name attached to the question. And uh, when David is complete with his talk, I will read the questions to everyone and we will work on answering as many as we have time for. So with that, uh, David, thank you for doing this. You have the floor. My pleasure. Good morning, folks. And Ernest, I couldn't agree with you more that the future will look much different than the past. In fact, I would say now looks much different than anything we've ever experienced. And there's times where it feels like we're in this surreal kind of environment as we're going about day-to-day -day life, leading organizations. And it just feels like this came out of nowhere. In a sense, it kind of did. Because if you think about it, today, the 30th of April, only marks 50 days since COVID-19 was categorized as a pandemic. It feels like 50 months or longer, but it's only been 50 days. And I would imagine when you did your 2020 plan for your organization, kind of like when I did my business plan for my company, you didn't take anything like this into consideration. Yet here we are. It's only 17 weeks into the new year. 
And the world is a very different place. Business as usual is anything but usual. It kind of feels like we're operating at that base level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that survival mode. But think of where we are relative to where we were at the beginning of the year. So there was a survey that came out the middle of January, and it asked C-suite leaders what their top priorities were for the year 2020. Here's what they said, and this is just in January. Number one was leadership development, facilitating employee engagement, emphasizing accountability, improving emotional intelligence, and leading across generations. All really interesting things for C-suite people to focus on, but hardly what you would consider survival level priorities. But here we are, and we're having a conversation today about what's next post-COVID. So what does it take to move to the next stage of new normal for your organization? Now, I chose the words in this title intentionally. Moving to the next stage of new normal. And I did that because I want to frame a perspective that recovery is going to be iterative. There will be a series of new normals, and we need to lead accordingly. So even if you're crystal clear that we won't be going back to anything that we knew in the past, let's acknowledge that the landscape is going to continue to change. And I think it helps to sort of contextualize that. So what we consider normal times are really kind of only points in time. Status quo isn't really status quo. It's just we're always in motion in the, in the world, in the business world, in our lives. So the old normal was really only a temporary point on a continuum of change. What COVID did is it came in and accelerated, radically accelerated how quickly things are changing around us. But still, it can feel like it might be too soon to talk about what's next because we're still in the midst of this extraordinary time. But we have a mission today. As leaders, we're called to look beyond the current conditions. And that doesn't mean that we think we have a crystal ball. We don't. It doesn't mean we're ignoring the current reality. It just means that we need to ask ourselves the question, what's next for our organization? And here's part of the reason why that matters today. So the Gallup organization that you're all familiar with, they've been studying people and organizations through crises for over 80 years. I mean, going back to the Great Depression, World War II, uh, they studied September 11th, the 2008 financial crisis and kind of how people reacted to that, and now COVID. And they found that one thing is crystal clear. People expect leaders to demonstrate confidence that there is a way forward and that individuals on a team can play a meaningful role in helping move forward. So let that sink in for a minute. People want to know that there is a way forward and that they can help, that it matters. What Gallup says is that in times of crisis, there tend to be two directions that human nature can pull us. One is it can take us down the path of fear. And the other is it can take us towards self-actualization and engagement. And on the engagement front, if leaders present a clear way forward, as human beings, we're really resilient. And there's something called the rallying effect, which is people pulling together toward a common vision to move past the crisis mode. That's why today vision and mission for organizations about the future, where we're going, is more important than any time in recent past. So the next new normal is being defined right now today. And as Ernest said, you have an opportunity to help shape the next paradigm for your organization. So let's talk about three areas of exploration, recasting a quarterly strategic plan, intentional discontinuation, and developmental opportunities for defining your organization's next stage of new normal. So here's the first one, recasting a rolling quarterly strategic plan. The emphasis here is on strategic plan and you know, whether your fiscal year started January 1st, starts in July or wherever it is, I think it's pretty safe to say that whatever your 2020 plan was, it's most likely irrelevant today. So in this environment where everything is dynamic, why does revisiting strategy matter? Well, here's one thing that we know, is that organizations that are proactive 
tend to be much more successful than those that react to the world around them. So while none of us anticipated this disruptive event around us, we can pr practice what I call adaptive disruption. So by adaptive disruption, I mean something happened that changed the world. And instead of waiting to see how things play out, see what everyone else does, we define how we want to move forward based on what we know today. And we do that by proactively adapting our strategy to the environment as we see it right now. I get this is not a conventional approach. Um, there's a tendency to kind of go to the budget first, but I think this is really important. But here's sort of the way the world looks at this. There's a study that just came out yesterday. It was a survey of corporate executives. And the question was, how does your organization react when your annual plan goes off the rails? And two thirds of respondents said, we tweak the plan and do the best we can. Now, the problem with this approach is that you can miss some really important opportunities and also take on bigger risks than you really should in an organization. So it's critical to take a long view and be really clear about what you're reaching for before you reach out. If we aren't clear, it's easy to be disappointed with the results. And so I have a story about being disappointed with results that I'll share with you. My daughter lives in New York and a friend of hers last summer was asked to dog sit. And so this friend took on the duty. This couple was going on vacation and they needed somebody to take care of their dog. So she's on dog sitting duty. And while she's there, the dog died. So she's distraught. She calls the couple and says, I am so sorry to have to tell you this. Your dog died. And they said, well, we're not totally surprised. He was an older dog. He was a 17-year-old. He had been having some health problems. So they weren't shocked. They said, listen, all you need to do is get the dog to the vet. Now, this was in New York. And my daughter's friend, Sarah, like a lot of New Yorkers, doesn't have a car. So while she felt this momentarily uh, sense of relief, knowing all she had to do was get the dog to the vet, she started saying, oh, wait a second. How do I get this big golden retriever to the vet? So she goes through a decision process and thinks, well, maybe I'll take Uber or maybe I'll have a friend give me a ride. But then the conclusion she came to was maybe the best bet is I bet I can fit that dog into my roller suitcase. So that turned out to be her plan. Took all of her stuff out of the suitcase, gets the dog in the suitcase, makes her way to the subway, gets on the subway to go to the vet. And she's got her hand on the roller suitcase just to make sure that it, she didn't lose it as the train was moving. Well, they come to a stop and she's kind of in her thoughts thinking about the events and somebody comes up and grabs the suitcase from her and starts running out of the subway train with the suitcase. So the reason I tell that story is I would imagine that that thief was very unhappy with what he got. So the moral of the story is be clear with what you're reaching for or translated to a business philosophy, taking a strategic view and having clarity about what you want really matters right now. And a great way to, re to, to approach this is sort of starting out with your vision. Now, an organization's vision, that's your picture of the future state, where your organization is going. And the vision connects what your organization does out to the external world. So it only makes sense that when the external world has changed dramatically, that you go back and you take a look at the vision and ask the question, does this still fit? It's really important to make sure you know whether it fits or not, because vision sets the course of where you're going and it informs the actions that you take every day in the organization. So ideally in an organization, everybody involved goes home at the end of the day, knowing why they came to work with you. And it's always about fulfilling the vision. So your future state may look a lot different, but right now it's time to ask yourself the question, all things considered, does this vision still fit our organization post COVID? Or do we need to refine the picture, right? Think about it. The needs of the people that you serve might have changed as we go through this experience. Your funding sources might have changed or something else structural 
might have changed in your organization. The point is, if you need to refine your future state vision, that picture of what the future looks like for your organization, this is the perfect time to do it. If it still fits, fantastic. So part of my nonprofit work is that I serve on the board of directors for Second Harvest Food Bank. And our vision is to eliminate hunger in Orange County. As you can imagine, there's been a big increase in demand of people that are food insecure in the county, unfortunately. And so I don't see our vision changing anytime soon. We need to keep working to fulfill that vision as demand has increased. But there are a lot of organizations that the vision needs to be refined because the people you serve, the way you serve them and so forth has changed. So the point is, this is a great time to examine it. And it's really important that you start with that future state picture, not the budget. Numbers are really important, but they only measure results, not why you exist. And so the way that I look at it is, when you start with vision, you're focusing on cause, not effect. The cause, and not the effect. So I kind of take this picture at the top of a funnel. If you imagine a funnel at the very top is that vision. And once you've got clarity around that, then you go to the next step, which is how do we bring that vision to life? And that's through the priorities. That's through the set of activities that you engage in every day to bring the vision to life. Now for most organizations on the planet, priorities have changed. The question is, what prioritized activities should you be engaged in right now to fulfill your vision? So for example, if your organization's vision is related to community enrichment through the arts, and your old priorities had you doing monthly art shows in the schools, maybe the next set of priorities would be focused on curating a quarterly art show that you do online. Whatever it is, the, the key here is to set priorities based on the new paradigm, not on what they used to be. So with the priorities defined, remember, top of the funnel is the vision, then the priorities, then that's when you start defining the metrics. That's where the budget comes into play. That's where you build the financial plan. And for a lot of organizations, if your fiscal year is starting July 1st, this is the great time to, great time to be examining these questions. Through each of these steps that I'm talking about them, it's really important to be clear that the next stage of new normal is just one of a series of stages. Your paradigm is in transition. So agility is really the operative here. Agility matters. Now, I recommend considering doing a rolling six quarter strategic plan. That gives you as much clarity as you can have right now with what you know today and things are changing all the time, it positions you to adjust as things change. So we know some sectors of the economy are gonna move a lot faster through recovery. Others are gonna be a little bit slower and that clearly impacts nonprofits. So agility to adapt to a fragmented recovery is very important. Let's move on to the second area of exploration as you plan how you move to the next new normal. And that is intentional, discontinuation. So the COVID event led a lot of organizations to either put all their activities on pause or to cut back to just business critical functions. If you suspended any activities during this experience, I encourage you to pause before you flip the switch and go back to everything you did before and ask the question, kind of take inventory of what activities, what investments of resources no longer serve your organization. That means taking a close look at every program, process, activity, service, anything that can be eliminated. Things that no longer serve, they're no longer useful, no longer relevant, they're a drain on resources, they're distractions, or they just won't be missed. And let's be honest, every organization, for-profit, not-profit, has those things that you just sort of hang on to, they're legacy things, and you don't get to getting rid of them, but this is the time to say, could we better deploy those resources somewhere else? Now, I spoke to an executive director outside of Orange County 
whose organization works with at-risk kids. They had three programs pre-COVID. They had to cut it back to just one. As they're looking ahead, they're gonna stay focused on just that one and they're gonna double down on that because they see that's where the greatest need is in their community. So they're gonna invest more heavily into that. And their plan is they go through the first half of their fiscal year, that's all they're gonna do. And then they'll reassess. So that's kind of the benefit of taking this quarter by quarter strategic plan that as the world starts to take a new form, as activities take a new form, you can adjust. Think of it this way, every organization, for-profit, non-profit is competing for the most valuable resources, for human resources, for physical resources, for economic resources, for non-economic resources. And when things are more flush, we have a little more latitude. We can be a little less rigid, but now we can't. Now we're in an environment where every single resource we've got, every person, every dollar, everything matters more than ever. So we have to ask questions about the activities that have outlived their usefulness and look for opportunities to free up capacity that we can apply more productively in the next new normal. Now, there is a corollary to this intentional discontinuation, and that is new additions. So are there new needs that your organization has observed during the crisis phase that may be worth exploring as you prepare for the next new normal? Maybe it's something that came to the surface that's right in your organization's wheelhouse, and it's an underserved sector in Orange County. Uh, this could represent a great way to reallocate your activities into something much more productive and take those resources that were less productive applied to areas of greater need. Perfect time to do it. Moving on to the third and final area for exploration, and that is developmental opportunities. So the COVID event helped us to see new strengths and some development needs of our team members and the organization overall. The question for today is how can you use these observations to build a long-term development plan for your organization? You know, I really believe one of the best ways to differentiate any organization is the way you develop your people. The better you are at helping people grow and develop in their careers, the better talent you tend to attract. So this is the time to say, what did we learn that tells us where we should focus attention for our own development? Last week, my colleagues, Karen Heron and Monica Horner from Executive Coaches of Orange County talked about fundraising beyond events. It was a fantastic presentation. And perhaps as we've gone through this, you've seen that Fundraising is an area that your organization can develop and grow. Now is the time. This is the very time to frame the plan on how you'll bridge the gap from where you are to where you want to be. Development opportunities also mean taking a look at your business model overall. This is the right time to ask the question, how are things working? Where can we make some improvements? And can we take that on right now so we create a business model that's even more impactful as we move into the next paradigm, into the next new normal? There's a saying that I love from Warren Buffett, and he's, I've heard him say this a couple of times, that it's only when the tide goes out that you can see who's swimming without a bathing suit. And the, the point he's trying to make there is when it's low tide, everything is out there for everyone to see. So I'll say folks, we are in a low tide environment right now. And if this event has helped you see previously unrecognized developmental needs on, for your team, for the organization, capture it for what it is. It's an opportunity to grow your organization as you get ready to move in to your next new normal. So let me wrap up my comments saying, you know, there's a lot that we can't control or even influence. On the business news this morning, I saw a guy who was talking about the tremendous freedom that comes from just saying, I can't control it all. Well, there's a perfect time to say that, and that's right now. We certainly can't control it. But let's take a look at what we can affect and start shaping a future that helps people see how their work 
connects to a bigger picture vision of your organization in the future as you start moving towards your next new normal. So Ernest, those are my comments and I would love to hear any questions that might've come up. David, thank you very much for that. That was an informative and inspiring presentation as well. Uh, so please go ahead and type in your questions in the questions box, any questions that you have for David. And as we wait for that, well, I'd like to ask you some questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, so we live in times of uncertainty, and it came suddenly, like we, we, we all noticed that. And so one of the, the first question that comes to mind is, what are the ways for leaders to cope effectively with the discomfort that comes with uncertainty in the context of leadership? You know, so, so that whole notion of uncertainty versus certainty is such an important element of, of leadership. And it's easy to lull ourselves into thinking we have certainty. Because the fact is, we never really have certainty. We may tend to believe because we get comfortable, but the world's always changing. And so we can sort of fall into a trance thinking, oh, things are just fine. But they're always dynamic. So I think an important characteristic for a leader is to say, I have to develop my muscles at being comfortable in discomfort because there's always going to be something. And even if it wasn't a global thing, it could be a regional thing, or it could be just your organization. The greater you build those muscles of, of comfort and discomfort, the more impactful you can be as a leader. And I go back, Ernest, to what Gallup said. It's that ability for leaders to be able to say, there is a path forward and we need to work together. There's something about that that's so powerful that helps people feel engaged and committed. So I think that those two are closely related. Thank you. So we have a question from our vice chair, Karen Heron. And the question is, how often do you review or update six quarter start plan? Okay, so, so if you do that rolling six quarter strategy plan, my recommendation is that as you get through a quarter, so think of the quarter, that 90 day period, every time you're halfway through a quarter, take a look ahead at the next six quarters. That may seem like a lot, but think about it. For most organizations, you're reviewing your financials every month. You're reviewing them with your board. You're going through the numbers with your finance person or people regularly. But what doesn't happen often enough is comparing and saying, is our vision still on track? Are our priorities still the right priorities? And how does that inform what these dollars in the budget represent? So my recommendation is halfway through a quarter, take a look ahead and say, what new information do we have that might help us reframe the next six quarters? It doesn't mean that it's a big strategic offsite and you go through the SWOT analysis and all of that stuff. That's entertaining, but that's not necessary. I think it's more important to just say, what new information do we have today that we didn't have when we established the plan? And how does that inform us on what comes next? Thank you, David. We have another question on the board. So I'll read it. This paradigm shift is revealing the need to ask our organization whether it should exist anymore. How do we lead and structure a constructive and productive conversation about the very existence of our organization and ask the hard questions. Wow, whoever asked that, that is a very courageous question to ask. It's not an easy one, yet it is an important one. So whoever asked that gets a gold star for leadership for the day. Here's my perspective on it, is you always have to come back to the vision. What's that future state picture? Where, what does it look like in the future? And, and vision to me, it's, it's a combination of, of the what, why, and how. So the mission, the strategy, the tactics, all of that is an outcome of the vision. If you keep testing into that picture and saying, is this picture still the right picture? Does it still fit? Then you'll be able to get to, does our organization still fit? Now, I believe every organization should be in a constant state of evolution because the world is always changing. So if you go through that 
what does the vision look like? What are, how do our priorities align? You might come to the conclusion and say, this vision is really way off track. It doesn't align. It worked 50 years ago when our organization started, but right now, not so much. That doesn't mean you just close it down. It means you say, what parts of this picture might still apply today? How do we align those pieces with the bigger picture? And can we make it align? If the answer is yes, then it comes down to framing a new vision statement, a new picture that informs priorities, investments, activities, and so forth. But it always, from my perspective, always comes to that vision. That's what drives everything. Thank you, David. Next question. What are your thoughts on bringing your staff into the discussion of the path forward? How do you ensure you maintain their confidence in your leadership? I think the part of the answer to that question is in the question. I think bringing your team into the dialogue is critical. I mean, let's be honest. Everybody is wondering what's going on. Everybody feels uncomfortable. If you're feeling it, your team is feeling it. So that doesn't mean that they're all sitting around the table for every part of a strategic conversation. It does mean that you're listening, you're hearing their input. Because part of the way you bring strategy to life in any organization is through people. So let's go back to the, the funnel and vision at the top priorities. My perspective, all of that should align with ultimately people's job descriptions and the way we evaluate their performance. If you have that alignment, their voice is critically important in everything back up through the funnel. And so if we miss hearing input from our team members, we're really missing an important dimension of the ingredients that go into the soup of our organization. So the question, how involved should they be? I think they should, they should feel co-ownership of the strategy, co-ownership of the vision. The more that co-ownership takes place, the more productive, effective, impactful people can be. There was a great study that came out about a year and a half ago now from Harvard Bus Business Review. They found that 93% of all respondents globally in this study said that they would take on doing more meaningful work in trade for higher compensation throughout their lifetime. What that says to me is at the crux of the question you're asking, part of the way you help bring meaning to work is helping people see how the work they do connects to the mission, the vision of the organization. So I think it's really important that you gather input, you frequently hear and engage and share the reality. It doesn't mean you share every single little detail. You don't need to. That's part of your job is to help distill things. Yet keeping the, the voices as a part of the discussion about where you're going and how you get there, I think is tremendously powerful. Thank you, David. So as we wait for more questions on the Q&A panel, I have another question for you. So you spoke about in the new normal, uh, identifying activities, processes, products or services that can be eliminated. What would be an effective technique for identifying these I think a first step in identifying what no longer belongs in your organization is making an agreement with yourself and everybody that's a part of the conversation to be honest. And, and I think those activities that don't necessarily, necessarily serve the organization, it's kind of like the story of the emperor's new clothes. Everybody knows the emperor isn't wearing anything. My guess is at your board uh, with your organization, people know which activities, which programs are not the most valuable. It's not personal. It's just making the best decision for the use of your resources to ask the questions and say, if we look and we say, donors don't care about it, it isn't serving a lot of our constituents, it doesn't closely align with our evolving vision, it makes it a candidate to say, our resources are probably better used elsewhere. I, I understand those are hard conversations to have especially because you may have legacy people involved with something and they're saying, 
yeah, but that's the reason I first came to your board or the reason I first wrote you a check. It makes it difficult. Yet the responsibility of leaders, again, is to look beyond the current conditions and say, what's in the best interest of this organization in the long run? Thank you, David. I want to go back to uncertainty and the uncertainty that we are experiencing in, in present social historical context. And uh, specifically when leaders are engaging uh, into strategic thinking and planning and action, and knowing that the current context is constantly uh, changing our time horizons, if, if you will, it's changing the, the, uh, the, the length of time that our strategy would have taken. So how would you advise people to approach strategy in the midst of uncertainty to still harvest new ideas that are consistent with a better tomorrow for their organization? Mm -hmm. There's a lot there. Um, one, of, one of the most important dimensions to answering that, I think, is that even as overwhelmed as we might feel today as leaders with all that's going on, you have to block time on your calendar. That's strategy time. I can tell you I do this. I am a uh, strong follower of color coding my calendar. I don't know if you can see it, but it's, uh, it doesn't come out very well. I color code my calendar and I make sure that I have strategy time regularly for my business. My business is changing pretty significantly. And so I've got to keep adapting it. And I did this when I was running a division of a large corporation. You've got to just always block some time. It feels almost impossible to do it, but you have to do it. You have to have just, whether you call it me time, thinking time, strategy time, just time where you shut your door, you have your cup of coffee or whatever you do, and you just think. That feels really uncomfortable, yet there is a lot of power in that. Clear-headedness, being able to just take a look ahead. Um, I can tell you with my coaching clients through Executive Coaches of Orange County, that's a discipline that I encourage them to practice. And um, it's, it just gives you the opportunity to see things better than you might have seen them otherwise. What goes along with that, because you, there was a lot of dimensions to that question, is always seeking input. And, and that means input beyond just the, oh my goodness, isn't this tough? That's an interesting conversation, but it gets pretty old pretty quickly. And so the more important conversations is, think of a couple of really important strategic questions that you can ask of board members, of partners, of team members, of anyone in your sphere that could have meaningful input so that you're always hearing beyond your traditional circle. A trap that leaders often fall into is keeping their circle too narrow. I mean, that's true of corporate leaders, nonprofit leaders, political leaders. The, the narrower you draw that circle, the less input that you get. And so I think it's important to have the top things on your mind, top strategic questions on your mind, and always be eliciting input. It doesn't mean you have to take everything verbatim, but the more you can hear that input, the more you can evolve ideas. So ideation, right? I mean, think, think about anything that's been developed in history. Rarely is it a light bulb goes up on, on the top of somebody's head and they have an idea and it's the next brilliant thing. Even the light bulb itself took over a thousand editions before they got to the incandescent light bulb that we use today or used. The, the point is to, to invite that ideation, invite participation in ideation, and that helps you refine, redefine your strategic priorities and what you should add or eliminate from your organization. Thank you. So we have a question that might not be directly related to the topic, but I'm gonna uh, read it anyway. Uh, uh, it has two parts. I'll answer the first part and I'll let you take a step at the second one. So let me read it first. Does ECFOC refer bankruptcy lawyers? We do not refer lawyers, but we can help you find someone. Uh, so here's the rest of it. We are facing insolvency due to canceling summer programs as programs were prepaid and refunds exceed cash on hand. So I suppose the question, David, is um, do you have any advice for the situation? So, so I feel like that's getting a couple of steps beyond 
our role here. I'll add to what you said, Ernest. I think talking to an attorney is a really good idea. And talking to your bank, your banker, is a really good idea to just see what ideas there are. What I'm seeing kind of in our country certainly is a lot more leniency when you've got these kinds of financial challenges. So mm -hmm. I think talking to a subject matter expert like your banker, and if you don't know a good banker, finding someone who works with nonprofits in particular is very helpful, but you, you definitely need professional help beyond the scope of what we do in EC of OC. Thank you. So uh, Kathleen, feel free to reach out to me with respect to, again, we don't do referrals, but I'll ask around within the organization to help you uh, find a, a, a a attorney that can help. Thank you for the question. Next question. Uh, in your opinion, what are the top two or three most important competencies leaders should focus on when leading their teams into the post COVID-19 new normal? Agility, adaptability, communication, emotional intelligence are the ones that come to mind for me, the emo emotional intelligence dimension, uh, in particular, that ability to listen, to empathize, to understand, and to be able to participate at an emotional level. This experience is an emotional experience. And while most of us in this meeting are not licensed psychologists, we need to be good listeners. We need to empathize and understand. And I think that feeds those other things, the agility, the adaptability. Adaptability and agility doesn't mean that we're Gumby and we get bent every which way by everyone who has input. What it means is that we have views, we align with the vision of the organization, and as new information comes available, we adjust. So I used the term adaptive disruption. And what that means is it doesn't mean you just go with the flow. It says you continue to read the environment around you and adapt appropriately to continue the furtherance of your organization. So those are the characteristics that I think are critical as we go forward. Thank you. Next question. What are some resources that we can utilize to assist with time management and scheduling strategic thinking time? Well, Executive Coaches of Orange County, of course, is the number one <laughs> resource that I recommend. Um, you know, there's, there's so much great time management stuff. I will mention one of my very favorite books of all time, and it's really old, but I reread it probably every two or three years, and it's called The Effective Executive. It's by one of my mentors, Peter Drucker, and I absolutely love it because it reminds me every time I read it what the job of a leader is. <laughs> and, and so it's getting as much time that you can combine into blocks and using that time as effectively and impactfully as you possibly can. So I think that's a really good resource. There's a bunch of stuff on the web. Uh, I talk about it in my book called Leading From Where You Are. So I think there are a lot of resources that are available. Thank you. Next question. What's an example of a strategic question? Where are we going? How do we get there? There's two of them right there. I'd start with, where are we now? Where are we going? How do we get there? From that, you can build a whole repertoire of strategic questions. You can adapt it specifically to things going on in your organization. I'll tell you the way I would look at it from, for instance, Second Harvest's perspective. So where are we now? We've seen demand increase significantly. Where are we going? Well, we're not sure what the demand curve looks like. We know it's gonna remain at this level for some time. So the best input we can get is, what is the state plan for reopening the economy? And if we suggest that this plan carries out the way it's laid out now, what will that mean in terms of people who need our food? And then working our way backwards. Are there activities that we've been investing in that we should divert resources into because we've got to access more food because we've got more people who need food? You could go through that kind of logic with any organization 
I think it always starts with where are we now? Where are we going? How do we get there? And then just sort of distilling, peeling back from there. Thank you. Next question. How does this environment impact a personal mission or vision statement? So again, I think that might be a step beyond uh, executive coaches of Orange County. I will share my perspective, which is visions for organizations are similar to visions for individuals. It's telling us what do we want? What do we want to be personally? What do we want our future to be? And so, well, I think that like with an organization, you de define from the inside out, you're continually surveying the world around you to say, where are their opportunities? How can I be of service? How can I bring my gifts and talents to new, bigger, different audiences? So again, that's getting a little outside of what executive coaches focuses on, but I think that it's the same kind of series of questions that you ask yourself, given what I see around me, does my personal vision still fit? Thank you. Next question. In your view, to what extent should the role of coaching change in supporting leaders succeed in the new normal? Mm. Well, I, th I think, Ernest, that sounds like our next uh, workshop. <laughs> um, so, so coaching, just like leading an organization, has to be adaptive. And I think that the coaches in our organization are always listening to clients saying, okay, how are you adapting? What has cropped up now that's testing your mettle, that's challenging you? Because the things that were your top personal priorities as a leader that you were working on with your coach 90 days ago may not be the priorities now. So if they have shifted, it's important in that coaching relationship that you go through that same exercise of reevaluating and say, what are the priorities today, right? So for example, I'll just pick one topic that could be real for your organization. Um, if you watch the news, you see nonprofit leaders nonstop. I saw uh, my friend Gloria Crockett, who is at Make-A-Wish on the news yesterday. She did a fantastic job talking about uh, National Wish Day. And she was on the news and did a fantastic job. But if your coach is not working with you on your presentation skills, and all of a sudden you're doing a lot more presentations, that would probably be a good thing to pop up on the list because it's gonna continue on for the next who knows how long. And so that might become the top priority versus something that was top priority again 90 days ago. So adaptive, being adaptive in that coaching relationship I think is critical. Okay, we're closing in on the end of the session. David, your final thoughts. Uh, my thoughts for this session are be adaptable, be agile, know that we're moving through a phase of changes. Mm -hmm. And I find myself saying, gosh, remember how great it was way back in January when things seemed normal and we had relatively normal lives, that's the wrong thing to do. It feels good for a little while, but it's sort of like sugar. <laughs> sugar mm -hmm. feels great until it wears off. So I think the more important thing for us as leaders is to keep looking ahead and saying, how do we bring that future into alignment with what we're doing today? How do we synchronize our activities and being that voice for the future that your team needs to say, there is a way forward and we're gonna get there together. David, thank you. So this completes the presentation session. So before you uh, sign off, I have a few announcements here. So next week's talk will be the six inspirational leadership practices presented by Tara Norton. Tara is an executive coach with us at ECMOC and uh, she is CEO at Accelerated Performance Solutions. So please watch for your email invitation for that talk. That's going to be the same time, same day, next week, Thursday at 10 a.m. And uh, before you sign off, we would greatly appreciate it if you took one minute to respond to our very short survey to help us improve our services to you. Zoom will make sure you get that survey. And uh, with that, this completes the webinar, and we will see you next Thursday. Thank you, David. Bye-bye, everyone.
Bye-bye. Have a great day.